Hallelujah. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. Even if you don't have a Bible, I've got it on the screen this morning. So you can read through this. I want you to get every word of it. It's so rich, so powerful, so good, so blessed. Yeah, let's stand for the reading of the word. Ephesians 1.10, I'm going to preach on God's guarantee. God's guarantee. He planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ, both things in heaven and things on the earth. In him we also were made God's heritage, portion, and we obtained an inheritance, for we had been foreordained, chosen, and appointed beforehand in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his own will. So that we who first hoped in Christ, who first put our confidence in him, have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. In him also, who have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, gospel of your salvation, and have believed in and adhered to and relied on, were stamped with the seal of the long-promised Holy Spirit. That Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, the first fruits, the pledge, the foretaste, the down payment, and our heri- on our heritage, an anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of His glory. Father, thank You this morning for this wonderful Word. Give us strength for the journey. And give us victory in our hearts. Amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. God's guarantee. God's guarantee. God's guarantee. Everybody say it. Hallelujah. It's one thing when J.C. Penney guarantees something. It's another thing when God himself guarantees something. You got to put it in red ink and circle it because it's important. Hallelujah. How do I know I'm saved? Well, God's got a guarantee. How do I know heaven's out there waiting on me? God's got a guarantee. How do I know that this is real, what we're doing, what we're believing? We can't see it. We can't taste it. We can't touch it. But we still believe it. Well, God's got a guarantee. How can I know that I can be strong and go through the last days, whatever they happen? God's got a guarantee. Hallelujah. And God's guarantee is always good. And I'm going to share with you about God's guarantee. Hallelujah. Let's back up here at the start of this thing. On the screen it says he planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ. Oh, glory to God. We are here strategically. You were born the right day. You're in the right church. You're believing the right thing. You did the right thing this week coming to prayer revival. We are strategically placed. Say, I'm strategically placed. Amen. You're here now. God has put us in the kingdom for such a time as this. And we're going to see the fulfillment of what God has promised I love the idea that I was born at the right time, married the right person, came to the right city, pastored all these years. I'm strategically placed. Hallelujah. And you are too. God has us where we need to be. I'm glad I wasn't born in the Apostle Paul's time. I'm glad I'm born today and living where I'm supposed to be. Verse 11, in him also we were made God's heritage, portion, and we obtained an inheritance. For we have been foreordained, chosen, and appointed beforehand 
in accordance with his purpose, who works everything according to the counsel of his own will. Think about that. You ought to be smiling. You are God's heritage. You've been in, obtained an inheritance. And you have been foreordained, chosen, and appointed beforehand in accordance with his purpose, who works everything according to his will. You're here at the right place at the right time, and we're going to see the destiny of God in our lives. Can I hear an amen? Verse 12, so that we who first hoped in Christ, who first put our confidence in him, have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. The whole purpose of my life is to give glory to God. I said the whole purpose of my life is to give glory to God. It's not to live 70 or 80 years and work your fingers to the bone and die and go back to the dirt. It's to give glory to God in this time. And if you do that, you'll have an inheritance that will never fade away. Somebody say, praise the Lord. We first hoped in Christ. And we've put our confidence in him. And because of that, we've been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. When I was a little boy, I was destined. I was appointed. I was a preacher's kid. But I loved God. I love the Holy Ghost. I used to sit on the front row of my dad's church and take notes, preachers that would come through. My heroes were the evangelists that my dad had. I thought they were so cool because they went across the country and they preached. And they got up and ministered to people and blessed people. And in those days... We didn't have much money. We let the guests stay in our home. So my bedroom, I got to give it up. But I'd sneak in there, and look at what kind of clothes they wear. I'd write down the name of their cologne, and I'd get mom to buy it for me. I just had hero worship on my mind for God's people. Amen. My uncle would come through and play the guitar and sing and preach. I got dad to get me a guitar and an amp just like his. And I played it and played it until I learned to play it. Amen. Why? Because I had that hope in me. I had that joy. I had that power. I had that wonderful love. I wanted to do something for God. I wanted to go forward in God. I knew this world didn't hold anything. You live, you die, you go to hell. 90% of people, that's what they're going to do. Great is the wide path and most that go to hell. Jesus said, strive to enter the narrow door. Few there be that get in. Aren't you glad you're a narrow door person? You've come through the narrow door. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You found it, and you're headed for glory. And there's not a thing the devil can do about it. I'm talking about being destined. I'm talking about God's working, in working in our lives from the time we're little. And, and uh, I always just love God, love the ministry. So all the time I would preach to my brother. And Bruce, and then when Mark came, he was real little, so he would always sit there. So I had two in my church, and I would, I'd get me a stick that looked like a microphone, and I'd hold it up, and I would preach, and I'd call them sinners and reprobates, and you're going to hell. I preached hellfire, and my little brother Mark, he didn't know what to make of it. He said, Doug, are you mad at me? I said, no, I'm not mad. You got to repent, you hypocrite. <laughs> and I'd give an altar call and both of them would lift their hands. Are you guys under conviction? Yeah, yeah. Well, get down here and pray. And I'd lay hands on them and we'd have church. We'd have church. We'd have church week after week. That was in me. That was put in me by God. And by living in a home that honored God and 
taught me the things of God. Forced me to memorize scripture. Amen. Mom had all the leverage. She was the cook. You're going to memorize so-and-so. Let me hear you quote it. And I couldn't. And she'd say, no dessert. The next day, no dessert. No dessert. Boy, it didn't take long for 1 Thessalonians 5.18 to come into my memory bank. <laughs> Destined. Destined. Put in our hearts. Hallelujah. And then God called me. I went out and preached the first summer after I got out of high school. Pitiful. Pitiful. My dad came to hear me in a little church there in Denver. And I said, Dad, how did I do? He said, you did horrible. Dad, I was looking for encouragement. You've got to get this down, son. Why? You said glory to God 48 times. Because I didn't know what to say. So I'd say, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Then I'd think of something else to say. But it was in my heart. It was God's in working. Then after I preached a summer and another summer, I went out and went to Tulsa and sang a song in my uncle's church and saw Brenda. And I liked what I saw. So I said to my aunt, who was playing the organ at the time, that girl in that orange sweater looks kind of nice to me. Is she a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah, she sings in a choir. She teaches Sunday school. I said, we're looking good now. And I got to meet her, talk to her, instantly drawn to her. Unfortunately, she had another preacher that she was dating and I had to whack that in two <laughs> get him out of the way <laughs> hey let me tell you competition never stopped any man if he sees a prize he wants and somebody gets in the way that just makes her all the more appealing amen that's right ladies remember that you don't have to throw yourself at his feet. You can just remain aloof. Get you another boyfriend and let him run him off. God was putting things together in my life. Because there was such a deep longing in my heart for him. I loved him. I wanted to serve him. I wanted to preach his word with fire and passion. I wanted to bring people to Christ. I had the deepest longing. And when I met her, I didn't know that six months before I met Brenda, that the Lord had spoken to her in an audible voice, audible voice, and said, break up with Bobby. Bobby was the drummer in the church and they were been dating and she was even, they were even talking about engaging and getting married. And uh, she heard an audible voice, break up with Bobby. She didn't know why, but she broke up with him that night. Broke his heart, he cried, carried on. I thought we'd get married. I did too, but God told me to break up with you, so you're out. Just like that. Why did God do that? Because six months later, I was coming to that church and God was going to destiny put us together. I needed her. She needed me. We were going to complete each other in the ministry. Everything in your life is orchestrated by God. You're in the right church. You're in the right place. You're hearing the right sermon. God has his hand intimately on us in ways we can't even acknowledge or understand. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for that. See what he said? We've been foreordained, chosen, appointed. Appointed. 
in accordance with his purpose. And especially in these days right now. We're in the last of the last church days. The trumpet of God is about to sound. The dead in Christ will rise. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're there. We're at the doorstep. So where we are right now is God ordained. It's in his plan. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 12, so that we who first hoped in Christ, who put our confidence in him, have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. We are here to give glory to God. Lift your hand up and say, Lord, I give you glory. That's what you were created for. You're created to give glory to God. Glory to God. It's not about you. It's not about what you want. It's not about what your plans are. You've given all that up. You surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. He's ruling your life. You're living for the praise of his glory. I said you're living for the praise of his glory. Whatever I got to go through, I'm living for you, God. However tough it gets, I'm going to praise you and live for the praise of your glory. I'm not going to back down or give up. I'm going to live for the praise of the glory of God. I'm here to glorify you. Get your mind off yourself. Get your mind off of your plans. Get your mind off of self-love. Quit being narcissistic and making everything about you. Get your mind on eternity. We're about to graduate to glory and receive a crown that will never fade away. Why? Because we lived for his glory. I'm here to glorify God. Come on, say it out loud. I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to glorify God. I'm here for one purpose, to glorify God. Oh, this job I got, that's what I do so I can pay the bills. But that's not what I'm living for. I live to glorify God. Hallelujah. Now we're getting good down in the 13th verse. In him, you also who have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, gospel of your salvation, and have believed in and adhered to and relied on. Woo! You heard the truth. You got saved and you believe. You continually have to believe. Because your believing is attacked continually. Every day the devil is after your believing. So you have to be a believer every day. You can't believe on Sunday. you got to believe seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We're called to believe. John chapter 6, what is the work of God, they said. Jesus said is to believe. To believe in the Son. To believe his word. Come on, put your hand above your head and say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I believe in you, Lord. You have to stay after your believing. You have to repeat it. You have to practice it. You have to thank God for it. Amen. You heard the word of the truth, the gospel, and you believed and adhered to, and relied on. Because you believe, and you adhere to the truth, and you rely on it, God stamps you with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. God stamps you with the seal of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Now we're into the candy section. We've been over there with the mashed potatoes and the broccoli, but now we're where the good stuff is. This is the rich stuff. God gives you the Holy Ghost when you believe. 
If you're a believer, you're a candidate. And the Holy Ghost is given to us as he stamps us with the seal of the Holy Ghost. Every time you speak in tongues, it's a testimony that you're sealed in God. That's why praying in tongues is so valuable, so important. It's you and God in private communication in a language that you don't know, but God knows. And it's secret and it's going on between you and him. And it's building you, it's edifying you, it's lifting you, it's encouraging you, it's putting heaven in your soul, it's removing all powers of darkness, it's driving out wickedness and uncleanness, it's making you to be what you need to be. It's called the Holy Spirit. And when you believe in the kingdom and you get in the kingdom, you're a candidate for the Holy Ghost. And God puts it in you because he stamps you with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. He stamps you with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. That's why David Wilkerson found out all those years ago. And less than 50% of Teen Challenge stood for Christ if they didn't get the Holy Spirit. If they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues, over 80% stayed true to God their whole life. What is your reason? What is your purpose? What is your hang up? How, when was the last time you prayed in tongues? Well, I don't have it. Well, you're at a Pentecostal church. Why not? We'll pray for you every week. I'll pray for you till I rub all the skin off your forehead. I'll get you through to the Holy Ghost. I don't care what it takes. We'll get some prayer warriors down here and circle you in and get you filled with the Spirit. You don't need to be messing around in L.A. without the Holy Spirit. You've got to have that infilling, that speaking, that narrative, that mystery, those words going between you and God. It's God's seal in your life that you are His and He is yours and nobody's going to undo the seal. Come on, act like you believe this this morning. Give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 Lift up your hand right now and pray in tongues. Glory. Glory. Siyada ba kanda da 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 ba ba ko. Shayada ba ra. Iyada ba ya ta ba ya da 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 ba ka ta ba ya. Hore da da ba ka. That's it. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, it's God's seal in your life. Glory. 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 I'd like to I'd like to see an outburst, an outroaring, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in this house this morning. We're gonna come down here in a few minutes and I think there's gonna be a roar of glory. I feel it building up. Amen. Let me finish this sermon. Verse 14 is the capstone. Verse 14. Hallelujah. 13 says, I'm stamped with the seal of this promised Holy Spirit. 14 says, that spirit is the guarantee Everybody say guarantee of our inheritance. The first fruits. It's the guarantee of my inheritance. How do I know what heaven's going to be like? Well, I can have some this morning. The Holy Ghost in you is the guarantee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Of our inheritance, the first fruits, the pledge, the foretaste.
Amen. I went to a holiday party not long ago and they had these tables spread out. And I thought that when I got there, I would, hadn't had lunch and it was dinner and I was hungry. And I was expecting to pack it in. You know, it was a holiday meal. But they, they kept waiting. They kept waiting and kept waiting. And I thought, oh man, I'm growling. My stomach is hurting. And I looked around and I saw a whole table full of little old bitty tiny about that big bite, bite-sized pieces of, I don't know what, <laughs> little foo-foo things that had whipped cream on them and cheese laying on the side. It took about 10 or 12 of them to get a real bite full. <laughs> but I asked the host, where's a little plate? And I went around that table a couple of times and loaded up. Went off by myself and sat down and started in. And they were good. They were, they were fine. It was okay. But I think about the Holy Spirit in the same way. He's the hors d'oeuvre. A bite size. A little a touch, a taste. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you pray in tongues, you're tasting and seeing. When we have a message in tongues like we did this morning, we're tasting and seeing the Lord is good. He's here. When you feel his presence invade your heart and you feel joy and peace, that's the taste of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. He gets us going. He keeps us moving. Amen. If you eat enough hors d'oeuvres, you can live forever. You don't need turkey and dressing. You get enough of the Holy Ghost, he'll carry you through every trial, every, everything we're facing. The Spirit of God is our guarantee of our inheritance of our inheritance. My wife's going through a long trial right now and I check with her every few days. I said, dear, has the Lord given you anything lately regarding this trial, this pain you're going through? Constant, constant, constant pain. It seems like from the time she fell on that elbow a year ago or more, She's had constant pain in one form or another. She goes twice a week. They work on her neck and her back and help her get through. And she has to take, you know, things to help her get through. And I have such compassion over her and I pray over her. And she goes week after week, keeps her head up, keeps smiling. She'll wince once in a while. But she just keeps believing God. I marvel at her constant faith, constant victory. And I said, Brenda, has the Lord spoken anything to you? Does he, has he given you any breakthrough, any insight? She said, no. Nothing like that of revelation, but he constantly ministers to my spirit. And he constantly... Let's me feel his love. He constantly hovers over my life and gives me joy and peace in the middle of this battle. Well, who couldn't make it if you don't have God doing that for you? How can you not go through a trial when you've got God, the Holy Ghost, constantly just whispering good things to you? And showing you and letting you feel his peace and his presence. Listen, that's the kingdom of God is his peace. That's how you know you're in the kingdom. You got his peace. That's all you need. Amen. He didn't say you're going to get healed every time. He didn't say it's only going to last a month. He didn't say you're going to have not going to have to walk through 
weeks, months, years of testing. But he did say, I'll be with you. He did say, I'll send the Holy Ghost and he'll pour some assurance on you. And you got that, brother, you got it all. I said, you got that, you got it all. Why should we think that we should be exempt from going through hard things and long things? When we look in this book, it's full of people that had to grind it out, had to believe God, had to stand in their faith. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The other day I was talking to God about one of my trials that I've been going through for years. And I said, Lord, I'm kind of getting tired of this. And he said to me, son, don't birth an Ishmael while you're waiting on Isaac. Don't take this trial I've put you in out of my hands and try to fix it. Because we all know how good Abraham and Sarah did with that. Wasn't that a great move? To let Hagar have the baby? That's what all the mess in the Middle East is over. Those two brothers can't get along. Right? You can start a world of problems when you say, God, I'm tired of waiting. I'm going to get this going the right direction. Since you're not moving, I'll do it for you. The Lord must laugh. He must go, boy. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep standing. I'm going to keep waiting however long it takes because God is the one with the answer. And that spirit is the guarantee, the foretaste, the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. Let's stand together this morning. Come on down.